Hello, and welcome to RNR's Ask the Expert. I'm your host, Valerie King, RNR's editor in chief, and I'm joined today by Kelly Ruan Melchiondo, attorney and partner with Bills and Sumberg's Construction Group. Her practice, located in Miami, focuses on complex litigation of claims involving construction. She works with both jury and non jury trials at the trial and appellate levels in federal and state courts. Kelly is also a member of the firm's data security and privacy team, which focuses on counseling clients on safeguarding their data in private info. She does this by drafting and implementing policies for data security and strengthening the internal controls, as well as assisting clients with data breach prevention and response. So, hey, at a time when adopting new technology to increase efficiency is a growing trend, and also a top challenge for the property restoration industry. I am so thrilled to have Kelly, a legal expert on the intersection of construction and data privacy here with me. It is of course no secret that big data for all of its benefits to collaboration, organization, speed, competitive edge and more does bring great risk. There's an ongoing privacy slash efficiency exchange at play within restoration and the wider world in which impressive cloud-based platforms are helping optimize office and field operations in meaningful ways, but they're also exposing contractors to vulnerabilities by way of the sacred data they share and store within. So as contractors move from pen and paper to digital documentation, inputting everything from invoices and P&L to job site photos and 3D scans to project estimates and more, they're left wondering where the data gets shared and how that could impact them. So we invited Kelly on to shed light on this realm where law, construction, and data privacy plus security meet. Thank you so much for joining me, Kelly. I'm so thrilled to be here, Valerie. Thank you. Of course. Okay, so can you start by sharing a bit about your legal experience related to construction as well as data security and privacy? Sure. Well, I have actually been a commercial litigator for almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years in May of 2022. Um, I have been practicing specifically construction litigation for approximately seven out of those 20 years and uh, data security for almost almost that long. And um, I typically represent developers, but have also represented contractors. And I do, like you said, everything from uh, litigation to assisting in some contract drafting to include important provisions, uh, some counseling of clients on data breach prevention and internal policy controls, which is so critically important uh, from everything from how, how to train their employees to uh, guidance on the type of insurance they should be looking at and uh, how much coverage to get relative to the size of their organization. Very helpful. All right. Can you set the stage by describing the intersection of construction and data privacy today, that wider world we're living in, and then uh, why you consider it an emerging topic? Well, sure. Just in the last year, we've seen uh, two pretty critical cybersecurity ransomware attacks that affected infrastructure in the United States. We've seen the Colonial Pipeline, and then we've also seen some of these smaller ones that have affected uh, the grids. Uh, the water supply and things of that nature. So um, construction and the construction industry typically is a very high value target for a malicious actor because of the scope and the breadth of the projects. Even on smaller projects, there are multiple actors involved. It's an attractive target for a malicious actor to find a way into a project because of the number of people who are involved. We typically have the developer, the contractor, and then all of the subcontractors and any vendors that those people are using. So there are a lot of avenues in to cause mischief and mayhem. And so the construction industry, I, I very near to my heart, but I don't know that the industry is paying as much attention as it should be to data privacy, not only for um, you know, its own employee security and its own employees information, but the project information. Everyone now tends to, even before the pandemic, go towards a cloud-based uh, approach in no matter what they're doing, whether it is storing their own accounting records or now the prevalence of 
software and equipment systems like Prolog and Procore. And so once you start using the cloud, there are even more avenues for malice to get involved. And so the intersection of construction and data privacy, it's pretty dangerous intersection, to be honest with you. And I think people need to start paying more attention. Very helpful laying of the landscape there with all of the nuances, complexities, and areas of risk. All right. So this whole idea of first party versus third party, you've written about this mm -hmm. very, comp very compelling ways, very intriguing how you separate this. So can you explain first party versus third party in terms of settings, contractors, store data, plus maybe some examples um, to help us grasp the difference of this, the settings that data is stored within? Sure. So first party data is typically, as, as the name suggests, the data that the person itself collects and uses, right? So we're talking about in a contractor setting, it can be everything from employee uh, data, such as their social security numbers and sensitive information for payroll, but it can also be any information that the contractor is itself generating. So uh, submittals, uh, product um, information, uh, RFIs to the architect, for example. Um, anything that the contractor itself is doing in-house. Third-party data uh, is anything that the contractor is collecting from other people. So it could even be subcontractor information at certain respects. It could be information that the contractor is buying from someone else, from a product manufacturer, for example. Anything incoming that is not generated in-house by the contractor. Thank you. Okay, now what are the risks and benefits associated with the two respectively, with first and third party data settings? Well, let me say that in both, there's a risk. There's always a risk inherent with collecting of data and storing of data. So the first party risk really is, what are you collecting and, and doing yourself with the data and how are you storing it? So the risk is really internal, right? Um, it, it's almost like that old movie, the calls are coming from inside the house. Um, with first party data, you really have to be protective and uh, careful with what you're doing with your own information, right? Your employee information and the information that you're storing for um, the people who are in-house. Um, so for example, if you are a contractor and I know that uh, your uh, client base is, is remediation. So if they are using their own trade secret uh, methods of doing things, if they have created a method for coming in and restoring after a flood that no one else in the industry is using, that's their first party data and they have to guard that very protectively. And so the risk is always that someone will get their hands on it, right? And so you're not really so concerned in the sense of a data breach exposing um, that information that is then sensitive and requires reporting to authorities and potential for, let's say, uh, you know, social security numbers or credit card numbers getting out in public, but you are exposed in the sense that you do want to protect your information. And so you need to guard that very carefully. So that's your first party risk is what did you create? What did you do? And how do you protect that? And it would be the same as in the old days when we had file cabinets and trailers on site or when we had an office. And so we wanted to make sure that everything was under lock and key and protected. In the data security world, with things being on the cloud, things being on software, things being transmitted by email, you lose some of that physical file space that you can control under lock and key. And that's where the risk comes in. The risk comes in and you're giving up some of that control over your own maintenance of what it is. In the third party setting, there are some other risks involved because you're also inputting information and taking in information from someone else. Now, we've all gotten emails that are you know, bad emails, right? And some of them have viruses. We're not talking about viruses in this context as a risk. Of course, it's a risk, sure. Um, a virus can corrupt your entire system. It is the way that ransomware can come in. But when we're talking about third party data risks, we're really talking about the liability issue, right? So we're talking about, oh no, what happens if the contractor, if you are the source of a data breach, if your employee clicks on a phishing email and all of a sudden that email lets the malicious actor into a project's entire system and everything grounds to a halt. Um, how does that affect your business? And so the third party data is what do we do when we get data from other people that is critical to a project and how do we protect that? And so the risk is always the protection, but yes, of course we wanna protect it for our own good, 
but also because there's a level of liability that comes when we can be the person at fault for leaking or having something catastrophic happen. And then we are left with this liability and responsibility that can cause delays, can cause all kinds of issues. Thank you for that. I'm excited to dive into both first and third party uh, deeper. Let's start what maybe some people may think the the opposite end of the spectrum third ver- before first, just because sure. it's such a big area of interest and concern sure. right now for property restoration contractors. As I mentioned earlier, many are worried about how and where data on their business operations and also projects and even pricing are being used. Can you talk about the collection and selling of data today? It, apparently, it's common in the consumer world as well. Uh, but just set the stage for us here on, you know, with our digital footprints being captured and even sold, is this what's happening? What's the, what's the lowdown there? Well, I can give you a 30,000 foot uh, view of this. So it depends on the industry. Uh, there is a cottage industry. It is a price profit center for a lot of businesses to collect data and then sell it to third parties. So it's everything from your telemarketer phone list to your entire customer base, um, your own personal digital footprint as far as you know like what Facebook's doing. I don't know that it's happening as much in the construction industry as in other industries because it's a much smaller community. And um, you know, I, I don't know if the client base is, is really doing as much of that, you know, massive consumer sales that like an Amazon or a Target would be. Is is the sharing and selling of data something that software vendors are doing with contractor data to your knowledge? If so, where does it get shared or sold and what do those parties do with it? Well, we haven't seen specific instances of it happening. Okay. So everything comes down to the terms of service when you're using a vendor, right? And this applies across the board, whether you're in the construction industry or not. It's important when you're looking just personally at where you're putting things to look at the terms of service. So I'm going to use a very simplified version, uh, Dropbox versus Google Drive versus you know Box, which is another security file sharing software. All of them have their own terms of service, right? And these are things that when we get uh, these emails or if you wanna download an app, it says you need to read through our terms of service. Let's face it, a lot of people are not doing that. And so people then are sometimes surprised when it does come down to um, you know, finding out that somebody did sell the data. They sold your email address and all of a sudden you start getting a million emails from vendors and people that you never have associated with. It's like getting catalogs from, you buy something from one company and all of a sudden in the mail, you've got 47 catalogs from a company that sells a related product. They're all intermingling. Now, whether or not a software vendor specifically for contractor data is doing it, we haven't heard of any instances of doing that, but it's important to look in the terms of service of anything before you sign up, right? So your, your pro cores, your prologs, your Ignites. So all of these software vendors, they could be doing it. Now, there are certain jurisdictions where they're not allowed to do that. So for example, if you're doing business in California, California has a very strict privacy law that requires these vendors to make you aware of what they're doing with their data. The problem is that not every state is California. And so there is no one cohesive federal jurisdiction law over data, sale, storage of any kind. And so it it remains to be seen whether or not this administration is going to get into a federal law governing data privacy and data usage. But right now, everyone is at the mercy of all 50 states and every state has a different law about what they can do. Some of the states are starting to go move towards what California has, which is a very transparent scheme that is very similar to the European uh, GDPR, which requires the educated uh, consumer. So these companies have to be very transparent with what they're doing. But again, not every state is California. So it's very likely that you could be operating in a state where the vendor does not have to tell you, and they can bury it in the fine print in the terms of service or in the privacy policy on their website, and you just never know about it. So it's important if that is a concern, and I do recommend that people do look at the terms of service to find out what is being shared, uh, not necessarily even just sold, but what's being shared with others. Now, companies also have the right to some in their terms of service. They do have also the right to use your data internally for their own purposes. So for example, if you upload something onto 
a cloud-based, um, and I'm not going to name which specific one does because I want everyone to go read the terms of service, but if you upload something into the cloud, the terms of service provide that the host can actually use your data. And so you could end up on a training video for the employees of that company with something that you maybe didn't want to have on there. So, you know, it could be a good idea to look at that, maybe switch your vendor, maybe encrypt what you're doing so that you only have the encryption key and it's in the cloud, but you are the only one who has access to it. There are ways around all of these things, but the important thing, the most important takeaway is to definitely look at the terms of service. That is so helpful. And you also, I, if I got you right, answered the question of, is this legal? It seems like, right, a big company should be doing things that are legal, but hey, people want to know, is it legal to do this? And it sounds like the legal landscape, it's not that simple. It's not federal. It depends right. on the state. But thank you for drawing the importance of terms of service. I want to ask, obviously, you specialize in, in litigation, and, and this is your area, but what's your take on getting, um, getting that kind of outside consult uh, when contractors are looking at terms of service, like if they if they truly do want to be careful before they invest, is this something that a number of lawyers could help them look at and and and, adjust, uh, and address and and make sure they're making the best decision for themselves? Um, how important is that? Well, I, you know, I, I'm a lawyer, so I'm always going to say it's important to consult <laughs> with a lawyer. But no, in this field, I I do think it is because here's here's the thing: this is such an emerging and changing and dynamic industry. And I think, you know, 10 years ago, the number of data privacy lawyers in the United States, you could probably count on both hands. And now it is an emerging legal industry also because the laws are so different and so all over the place. Um, every state is different and every state comes up with its own policies and even the definitions across the board, there's not one model idea. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission does have uh, some regulations in place to guide what uh, particular data can be used, but that's only for companies that are subject to the FTC. And so there are some models, but for example, private data or personally identifiable information changes across the board as far as the definition goes. So it might mean one thing in Nevada and an entirely other thing in, in New York. There are reporting obligations that are different. So Yes, it's a great idea to talk to a lawyer, but it's also you know a good idea to talk to maybe a data security and forensic vendor. They ah. provide excellent services, and it's also a great idea if you're thinking about getting coverage or if you already have cyber coverage, which I think is a great thing to have, no matter how small or large your organization is, it's definitely something to look into. A lot of the times, the insurance companies provide these services as part of the coverage. So they have people in-house that can help and assist, not just at the moment of catastrophe when the breach happens, but through counseling. And so if you're looking to invest in coverage, sometimes you, you can use that as a perk of your policy and your, your insurance coverage to have somebody to speak to, to guide you through. They also, insurance companies also have sweetheart deals with certain vendors and certain cloud-based operators. And so they can actually give you a good rate on someone that they know to be safe and well-rated security-wise. Thank you for that. All right, this next question may lay, layer into the com complexity and the variety when it comes to the overall landscape of different laws and right. definitions, but once a contractor inputs data into a third-party cloud-based platform, they're out in the field estimating, they're at the office just putting their billing into the system, like who is legally the owner of that data once they put it into a cloud-based storage space that's that they're they're hiring an outside vendor to host. So is it the contractor? Is it the software vendor? Is it the property owner whose picture, whose house they're taking pictures of? Um, is it another party? Is it everybody? Right. <laughs> What's your take there? Yeah. So that's that's a great question because it it is, I'm gonna give you the standard lawyer answer and then I'm gonna explain. Um, it depends. And that's, you know, the lawyer joke is always that the answer <laughs> is, is it depends. Now it's a very interesting idea, right? And I said before that when you have a cloud based, you have to look at the terms of service because you have to see when you upload something into the cloud, who then owns it, right? Most cloud companies will say that you of course still own your data because if they didn't say that, they'd have no customers whatsoever, right? So you, uh, you retain ownership rights. Now in the sense of you have a remediation contractor, let's give an example, right? You have a flood in the house, and the remediation contractor goes in with the insurance adjuster and starts taking all the pictures and um, 
the property owner's there and it's, it's obviously the property owner's house, right? The photo itself though, the property owner didn't take the photo. So the data is the photograph, right? And so the contractor would own that photo. The property owner obviously owns the house. Now, if the property owner provides to the contractor any kind of information, such as the blueprints of the house or photographs of the house before what before the, the catastrophe, and this is what we want it to look like when we fix it, and that is the property owner's data. So again, you, you mentioned levels. There are levels and layers, right? And so when a property owner gives a contractor the photo or the blueprints, the property owner still owns that. And that's a, that's a, there are a lot of um, you know, laws involved with this and in all kinds of legal terms for bar exams that we could talk about, but just on a basic level, the property owner still owns whatever the property owner provides the contractor. The contractor owns whatever the contractor generates. Uploading it into a cloud-based platform doesn't deprive either of them of their ownership, but it may give the vendor the sharing rights that I mentioned before, so the right to use it. The vendor is not able to go and sell it or remove it from the cloud without the consent if, if the terms of service are written well and if the vendor is, is reputable and safe, but there certainly is uh, you know, an ability on some of these vendors to be able to use it internally for their own purposes. And so every person owns its own property. Now, the, the best way to protect everybody on the chain is to make sure that these ownership rights are specified explicitly in whatever contract or agreement is going to govern the work that the contractor performs. So on big projects that use standard AIA contracts, they have entire sections about ownership of contractors work for hire, right? So there's copyright and intellectual property issues involved. There's also, okay, so we generate our project schedules in native using P6 or some other scheduling software. And at the end of the project, as part of the closeout of the project, we then as the contractor turn it over to the owner or we negotiate and we say, no, the contractor retains the ownership of this owner. So you're gonna pay us extra if you want ownership of whatever we give you. That should always be spelled out in the contract because there are fights later on. And to avoid those fights, everything should be explicit in the contract. The property owner should say, okay, I want your photos back at the end of this because it is my house. Even though you're taking a picture of my house in a current disaster state, it is my house. And there are things in my house that are mine. That's something to negotiate at the beginning of the contract because anything the contractor generates belongs to the contractor. And so if the property owner wants it back, the property owner needs to negotiate that in the contract. Wow, I'm learning so much. Very insightful stuff here. So is there a way for contractors to find out what's being done with the data they share and who it's being shared with as they've already agreed to a certain vendor? Uh, even if it said in terms XYZ was going to be done, is there kind of a way to keep a pulse or run a check on, I don't know, the state of the use of their data? So some vendor contracts do have audit rights, right? And so what I typically counsel people is that when you're looking to retain a vendor, you want to look at the vendor's reputation. You want to look at the vendor's standard agreements because uh, you know vendors also have confidentiality obligations, not just the cloud terms of service, but when you're signing an agreement with a vendor, especially if you're coming into a project where you're also then signing an agreement with the owner of the property, there, there have to be rights across the board for everyone so that everyone's clear. And so what I tend to counsel my developer clients is you're going to want audit rights on everybody, right? So if you're signing a contract with a contractor and you know that the contractor on the project is using a big software system like a Prolog or a Procor, you're going to want to know every step of the way how secure that data is. What is the contractor doing to secure the data? What is the contractor doing to employ its to, to train its employees? What are then the subcontractors' obligations to the contractor if they're also getting access to this? And so we tend to write into our contracts audit rights for the people who are involved in the project at every level, right? So a subcontract will be follow form to the prime contract so that the developer has the right to come in and audit the subcontractor security. Now you're thinking, well, I'm only the Windows contractor. I've got maybe $10,000 worth of, of work on the project. Do I really have to do this? It's a bit onerous. And sometimes it is, but it's important to have things on paper. Can you go back as somebody and have uh, audit rights into when you sign up with one of these big vendors? 
it's entirely possible. Um, what you have to do is when you're choosing the vendor, talk to them, look in the standard agreement. Don't just sign anything that they put in front of you. Ask the questions before you sign the agreement. And if there's an edge because one vendor does allow you to go back and check in with what is happening and does agree to let you know, because sometimes it's also notification, right? So the, own, the, the vendor needs to have some prompt notification obligations to tell you, oh, we had a breach and we think that this could have been exposed. You would be amazed at the number of times that a vendor will discover something six months before and will not notify because no personal information was involved, right? So none of the social security numbers were, were let out, but they can't pinpoint exactly was what, what was let out. And so they need to notify you and you need to write them your contract. Very helpful. Okay, so to be super clear and ask the dumb question, when we talk about um, consenting and, and talking about uh, these agreements and terms, this is before you sign on and hire or hire on a particular vendor, um, right? So in terms of when quote unquote mm -hmm. consent normally takes place, if I'm a contractor saying, yes, it's ideal that this is happening before I have joined, before I've picked a certain software vendor or, or a cloud-based data storage vendor. Yes. So first of all, there are, no, there are no dumb questions when it comes to data security <laughs> because it's such a changing landscape that the question that I answer today could be a completely different answer tomorrow. But this one is very basic and it's a basic and important. And, and if, if, if you get nothing else but from what I'm telling you today, <laughs> always ask the questions first. I know people who are probably listening to this are thinking, these are a lot of steps and I don't know that I need to take this because I've only got a couple of thousand dollars in this project. Okay, so here's the thing. On a data breach, it can cost a company up to $3 million per breach. And we're talking just in, in a standard data breach where it's the social security numbers that go out, we're talking about $3 million per breach. And so even if it takes a few days, a couple of weeks at the outset to ask those questions and it seems onerous and it seems, oh God, why do we have to do this? You're saving your time later, okay? And it's the same thing with if you have a breach or if you have a theft of, or extortion or ransomware where they're basically holding your project hostage because they got into your system and they've got all of your files and they're encrypting them and they're not gonna let them go. The catastrophic effect on a project of a delay of even a couple of days, we all know it, right? So a delay of a couple of days on a project affects all the trades underneath what you're doing. It affects everything. So we have to go back and re, a, a couple of days can translate into months. So it's better to do thing, everything beforehand because a lot of the times, unfortunately, and the reality is there isn't a lot of room to fix it later. We don't get do-overs in this. Once it's out, it's out. And then we have to scramble and figure out, okay, let's just stop the bleeding. Whereas you could have entirely prevented it before. All right. Now we talked a lot about preparation in the beginning and investing in these platforms, these vendors. I'm curious about the end game. So if I'm a contractor in putting data into one of these software programs or, or cloud-based storage spaces, again, whether it's data on my operation side, documenting a project site, pricing something else, what happens if and when I end my contractor subscription to that provider? Do they get to keep all of that data I've input over the months and years? Um, do they have to share that data with me in some way and delete it forever? Do they own that data forever, what happens when I cut the cord and maybe I go somewhere else? Well, again, we're gonna go back to the two things that we talked about, right? So the terms of service and the contract and depending on the jurisdiction and the law in the jurisdiction, right? So there are opt-out provisions in several states that require the ability to purge the data from the vendor's data database. And so there are, there are opt-out provisions that say, you know, if I decide that I don't want to do this anymore, you have to, you have to return everything to me, or you have to give me proof that you've destroyed it. Again, it goes back to your terms of service. It goes back to your agreement with the vendor. If you decide um, that your project is done and that you want your data back, typically what will happen is you will request it and you will request either that they return it or that they purge it. And that's written ahead of time into the agreement. Very helpful. You've already spoke to the uh, the different stakeholders, including a homeowner or a business owner, like the property owner, and mm -hmm. how it again that depends uh, their rights in terms of the data. But generally, 
if it's not their pictures or it's not their blueprints that they shared, it, it could probably be the contractors. Um, I mean, are there any best practices like that contractors should go by in terms of um, I'm at your house, I'm doing a 3D, you know, imaging of your of your basement where there was a flood or I'm taking pictures and documenting all this stuff about the project. Is there another layer there of just like, I don't know, a good business practice to let them know this is happening and hey, here's the la- here's a high level of the landscape kind of thing in terms of the data privacy? Yes, I always believe in informed consent no matter what. So if they're doing a project in the house, they should definitely let the homeowner know what's going on and what that entails. And they should also have a waiver to be signed for publicity purposes. So there are certain jurisdictions that if you intend to use any of the photos in the before and afters on your website, for example, you need to get the vendor, you need to have the sign off of the person whose home it is. Uh, Even though you own the photo, there is still uh, you know, some liability if you're out there publicizing someone's internal house. And so you do wanna have a waiver, you wanna have a, a statement in writing that the person is informed that you may use the photos, that you are going to log the photos into the cloud and that they agree that you will not be liable to them if something happens. Now there may be pushback from the homeowner, but certainly if you have informed consent and you've told the homeowner, this is what's happening then this is what we intend to do. That's a level of protection for you. Now, what you can't do though, is have a waiver signed and then go do something that you didn't inform the homeowner about. So for example, you cannot go and get a homeowner to sign off on you using the photo for the website and then go and sell it to another company so that that company can use it marketing if you decide to do that. You need to make sure that whatever you're having the homeowner sign off on in the waiver is what you're actually doing. And that's, that's just best practices. You wanna make sure that the homeowner knows exactly what he or she is waiving, gives you that waiver clearly and that you stick to that plan. Thank you, especially for adding in the important part about wanting to market uh, sure. before and after is so huge in construction, especially in restoration projects. So take note listeners, very important mm-hmm. stuff. Even, even for things like social media, right? So, uh, um, you know, a lot of us do marketing on social media and we have progress photos. So for example, I have a lot of friends in the construction industry who are doing their own private residences or they're doing residences for other people that are friends and they're using these beautiful photos of from the ground up or they're doing a restoration and, and oh, the floors are going in today and oh, here are the windows. And so you wanna make sure that you are allowed to do that and not just on your website, but if you're going to be using social media, you wanna make sure that waiver is as clear as possible. They are consenting to having everything out there in the open. And if they don't consent, you, your next project probably will. So you just wanna make sure to protect yourself with that level of, of knowledge from the homeowner that you're working with. Thank you. Okay, so we've talked a lot a lot about what I'm going to ask again, but maybe we just button it up with with the high level takeaways of, sure. like you said, if nothing else, do this. So best practices for contractors as far as protecting the privacy and security of their data and the data of the policyholders they serve. First, what should I do if I'm a contractor looking to invest in new software today? What should I look for, look out for, and ask a vendor if I'm making a purchase? Um, and thinking about uploading my sacred data to a given platform. Is there like a first step here or a a, if nothing else, do this? Sure. So the first step obviously should be um, the bang for your buck, right? So you don't necessarily want to go with the most expensive vendor because uh, quantity of price doesn't always equal quality of security, right? So a lot of the bells and whistles, for example, of great user-friendly tools don't necessarily translate into great security. And so you really have to do an internal assessment of what is your tolerance of the risk, right? And so you might need all those user-friendly, wonderful project management things that generate everything from invoices to submittals to RFIs for you to do it. Um, But maybe it's not as great on security. So really you have to take an internal look at what you're willing to, to do and tolerate. And knowing that, you know, if you employ a vendor and something happens with the vendor and that vendor doesn't have security and liability Uh, levels with you or to you, then you're going to be on the hook, right? So the questions that you should be asking are, what are your security protocols? What do you do with the data? How do you protect it? Do you encrypt my data before it goes into your system? Is it password protected? Um, How many passwords are we allowed to give out? How many people on your side have access to my data once I give it to you? 
So is there an entire team of people in the background of the vendor that have access to it, or is it generally under lock and key from only a few people? Um, another question I would ask, which is becoming very important with ransomware attacks these days is, are there backups and are they stored somewhere else? So for example, the greatest way to neutralize a ransomware attack is to have backups somewhere else so that it's not a crippling delay if something happens. You can, you, you can neutralize the threat of an extortion if somebody's holding it over your head and you have backups and you don't need that data that they're locking because you have a backup somewhere else. So the question would be, do you have the backup somewhere else? And also who has access to that? And how often are you backing up? Because if they're backing up data and they only backed it up a month ago and you've put a month's worth of information into the vendor since then, it's not gonna be as useful to you as if they're backing it up every day. Now, some of these are more costly, but it's a good question to ask. And so the other question I would ask also is, um, you know, how much can I, are you offering training for my own employees on how to use this information? Um, so are, is the vendor willing to sit your employees down and explain to them how to use the software so that they are very well versed in how to get in and out and not just use the bells and whistles, but how do they report something to the vendor? How do they uh, report if something looks fishy to them with data? And so that's something that you should definitely be talking to your vendor about. The other best practice that I do want to mention is employee training. It's incredibly important, no matter what, to train your employees. Even if you have three employees or you have 300 employees, it's really important to train your employees on basic data security and prevention. So that can be everything from a quick tutorial online. There are a lot of vendors out there that offer tutorials on email safety how to recognize a malicious link, how not to fall for a phishing email, how never to click on a link that you don't know and never to log in. Um, it's everything from password protection so that you know, for example, not to use your same login password if you have a work email and a private email to never be able to give away your credentials to anyone else. It's also security of any physical structure so that your servers cannot be tampered with, um, maybe keeping things off site. And so employee training is something to definitely invest in as a best practice in any industry, but especially in the construction industry, because we have a lot of hands on deck sometimes. Thank you for that. Very helpful best practices. If we're looking to invest in stuff, the right questions to answer. Now, if I'm already invested in a software vendor um, or a third-party vendor, what could I maybe do today to ensure my data is as secure as possible um, after my investment has been made? Is there anything I can do now? Uh, to check in if I haven't maybe taken the ideal steps before I uh, partnered with them or haven't really checked in since partnering with them? Sure, so you want to pay attention to any communications that you get from the vendor. So a lot of the times vendors are constantly uploading and updating their own software, right? So they may send out patches, they may send out new versions of it. And while it may seem a little annoying to have to sit there and you know download an update, uh, you know, those updates are usually important. They're usually security related. And so you want to make sure to pay attention to those emails that you're getting from your vendor. Uh, even if they seem like they're just automatically generated and they're junk mail, you want to make sure to read it because a lot of the times they are updates and you want to uh, do whatever it is that they're telling you to do as far as updating the software, or putting in patches. And that's not just from your vendor, but it's from anybody. If Microsoft, you're, if you're using Office 365 and they're sending out patches, if you're using Apple, it's updating your iPhone. It's updating whatever apps you have on your phone or elsewhere that are helping you do your job. You wanna make sure that it's all complete and up to date and that you're using the most and the latest software. So that, that way, if there is something that happens, it's a lot easier to go back and trace what happened because you have a log of the most recent um, information. Also, it's a good idea to have a vendor rep. You know, Sometimes when you have um, a vendor that you work with, they, they will offer customer service reps. Make sure maybe if you have a vendor rep that you can talk to and call every once in a while and say, I've got a question about this. Establish a good relationship. We all know the construction industry is a lot of who you know and establishing relationships with people. And the same thing goes for vendors. Vendors are always gonna want your repeat business. So they're going to wanna keep you happy. And so it should never be a chore or a burden for the vendor to answer your questions. And that's important to keep tabs on it. Thank you. Okay, I don't want to sign off before talking about first party in that data setting, which I realize could be a whole a whole another hour long conversation, which maybe we maybe we revisit that down the line. But uh, you talked about this to, to, to make it super clear from what you've seen, how well is the construction industry doing to protect their in house data? Well, it, you know, it 
the construction industry is huge, right? And there are a lot of different players and some people get it great. Some people don't do as great. And so um, what I always tell everybody is your, your greatest asset is your weakest link. And it's really your employees, right? And so there are a lot of industry, uh, a lot of employees out there in the construction industry that are still adapting to using emails, they're still adapting to using the cloud. They're not doing things the way, they, the way that they used to. They can be resistant to change because I think as humans, we are. And I think they're thinking like, oh, I really don't want to have to go to this training. So the most important thing is to kind of keep tabs on what your employees are doing. Maybe limit the number of people that have access to the data. You know, if, if you have a, a software system that you're using and not everybody has to have an, a login credential, not everybody has to have a login credential. So really kind of maybe do a risk assessment of your own. I think it's it's great. A lot of vendors out there will do forensic risk assessments for you. They'll come in and they'll they'll test your employees. They'll send phishing emails. They'll, you know, it, it may make sense for your business if you have a lot of employees, if you're really worried about your sensitive data, especially for those vendors that have uh, come up with their own trade secret formulas for things. You know, your your information is very valuable, not only to uh, a malicious actor, but to your competitors. And so it could be anything from a disgruntled employee who is going to go over to the guy across the street who does things and, and taking your customer list or taking your information. So um, you want to make sure that you have a security assessment done uh, if it makes sense for you. Now, if you're only you know three employees and you've known them forever and they're part of your family, maybe you don't need it necessarily, but you'd be surprised. So it might be a worthwhile investment to call a forensic vendor or a data security vendor and have a little security assessment done. If you're looking to get insurance, sometimes the carrier will make you do that so that they can know their risk before they write you a policy. And so it's not a bad idea to talk to a potential uh, cyber liability carrier to find out you know, your levels of coverage. What, what would they write for you? What kind of policy would they write for you? Maybe shop around. There are some great uh, cyber liability insurance carriers out there who are writing policies even now as, as the ransomware uh, attack uh, threat environment has changed the construction insurance industry a bit because of the high value targets, but there are still some really great customer service oriented policies uh, and brokers out there who know their stuff and they're, they're not, they're very helpful and they're good people to talk to. All right, so final question. In close, in your opinion, do the benefits of big data outweigh the costs for contractors? I think I'm going to answer globally. I think the benefits of big data outweigh the cost for everyone, but the, it, as long as we recognize that the costs are great and that there are things that we can do to mitigate those costs and that we pay attention. The world is becoming smaller and smaller every day with the technology and, and what we do with it. But the most important thing is to be an informed and aware consumer and an informed and aware customer of vendors. And so you just need to pay attention, right? You need to pay attention before you click on things, before you buy apps. And, and the thing is that it's a responsibility that we all have to take. And so I think that it's made the world a lot smaller. It's made projects run a lot smoother than having to keep all that paper and, and keep your files. And it, it, it um, I think the benefits definitely outweigh the risks, but as long as we recognize that there are risks and that there are ways to protect ourselves and mitigate those risks, go into everything with your eyes open. Oh, thank you so much for your time and insight, Kelly. This has been so great. Uh, before so we, yes, before we go, where can listeners go to connect with you or to learn more about Bills in Sunberg? So we are at billsinsunberg.com and um, I'm Kelly Ruan Melchiondo. I'm on the website under people. You can learn all about our construction department. And we also are a full service law firm here in Miami. Uh, but just because we're in Miami doesn't mean we don't have clients everywhere. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Bills in has a global reach out of our Miami office. So check us out. Awesome. Thank you again. Thank All you. Right. Yes. Listeners and viewers, for more insights on restoration, remediation, and the people behind it all, visit our website, randrmagonline.com, also Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. If you haven't yet, please be sure to follow the podcast to keep up with our latest episodes. And if you could give us a quick review and rating, we'd greatly appreciate it. We're also on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, so we invite you to follow us there too. This has been r and Ask the Expert. Thank you for listening.